Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah in the name of God. And all praises due to God and peace and blessings be upon the Messenger of God, Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. May the peace, mercy and blessings of Allah be upon you. Hello and welcome to this year's first intellectual event for the 2023 Islamic Awareness Week. Today is a day where perspectives will be challenged. I ask before we start to consider the statement of Malcolm X. One must be flexible in every intelligent search for the truth. And that's what we should see this debate as. Not as a contest, but an investigation of what is true. I ask everyone here to open their ears, mind, and most importantly, their hearts, and approach this debate with the sincere intention of seeking what is true. May God guide us all to what is true. All right, so on a separate note, the toilets can be accessed on this same level, so level three right outside. And the prayer areas for the brothers for Salatul Aisha will be down here. And for the sisters, the prayer is uh, on level four in front of the elevators. So the structure for today's debate will be ran down by the moderator. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce both our esteemed guest speakers for tonight. The speaker representing the Muslim perspective is Sheikh Wissam Sharkawi. He began his studies in Fatah Institute in Damascus in Syria. Learning from traditional scholars, he has translated a number of foundational texts in Islamic jurisprudence and creed. In 2018, Sheikh Wissam began a PhD in social psychology in identity at Western Sydney University. Now the speaker representing the Christian perspective is Samuel Green. Samuel Green became a Christian while at university and has been involved in various Christian ministries and since 1999, he has worked with the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students, AFES, as a campus evangelist and Islamic engagement director. Engaging with Islam is one of Samuel's main interests, and he has degrees in theology and chemical engineering. This debate will be moderated by Amir Ay, who is a current student at Sydney University. All right, with the introductions out of the way, and before we begin with the first speaker, we'll have a short Quran recent recitation by Brother Omar, the translation being given by Brother Anas. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Wa minhum ummiyuna la ya'lamoon al-kitab illa amaniya wa inhum illa yadhunnoon فوين للذين يكتبون الكتاب بأيديهم ثم يقولون هذا من عند الله من عند الله لا يشتروا به ثمنا قليلا فوين لهم مما كتبت أيديهم ووين لهم مما يكسبون وقالوا لن تمسنا النار إلا أياما معدودة قل أتخذتم عند الله عهدا فلن يخلف الله عهدا أم تقولون على الله ما لا تعلمون بلى من كسب سيئة وأحاطت به خطيئته فأولئك أصحاب النار هم فيها خالدون والذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات أولئك أصحاب الجنة هم فيها خالدون And some among them are illiterate, who have no knowledge of the book, but have some fancies and do nothing but conjecture. So woe to those who write the book with their hands, and then say, this is from Allah, so that they may gain their, thereby a trifling price. Then woe to them for what the ha their hands have written, and woe to them for what they earn. They say, the fire shall not touch us for more than a few days. Say, have you taken a pledge from Allah, and Allah will not go against his promise? Or, do you say about Allah what you do not know? Why not? Those who commit evil and, and are besieged by their sins, those are people of the fire. There they shall live forever. As for those who believe and do good deeds, they are the people of paradise. They will, they, there they will live forever. I'll now give it over to Amir Ay for the moderator's address. Assalamu alaikum and good evening everyone. My name is Amir and I'll be the moderator for tonight's debate. So I'm joined by Sheikh Wassam on my right and Samuel Green on my left. Before we get started, I would like to break down the structure to the audience. Um, so that there is no interruptions, please leave all your questions to the end for our question and answer segment. 
The structure of the debate is as follows. The first part of our debate is the opening statement where we'll give each speaker 25 minutes. After five minutes, I'll ding it once. After, sorry, not after five minutes, but with five minutes left, I'll ding it once. Uh, with one minute left, I'll ding it twice. Once their period of 25 minutes has ended, we'll allow them to finish their sentence, but I'll ding it repeatedly. <laughs> so, uh, once that's done, so once the 25 minutes have passed, we'll move on to the next speaker. And the next part of the debate is where each speaker will be given a seven minutes uh, rebuttal. So I'll give a reminder again at two minutes left. And a final reminder at 30 seconds left. And then once those seven minutes has ha have ended. So um, that will allow us to move us to the next speaker. So after this, we'll have a short 15 minute break to pray Salat al-Isha. There'll be refreshments outside, take a break, relax, unwind after all these debates and stuff. Uh, following this, once we all come back, we'll have 30 minutes for our audience Q&A, where members of audience, so you guys, can actually get the chance to ask any question directed at any of our prestigious speakers. So at the end, we'll have a four minute closing from each speaker. So, without further ado, I would like to start with Sheikh Wassam's opening statement. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters, distinguished guests, thank you very much for being here tonight <coughs> to engage in this robust discussion. Thank you, Samuel, for being here again. I didn't know how fast you could get on a plane, but uh, you seem to make it here pretty quick. So, welcome. Tonight's topic is the preservation of the Qur'an. We are going to delve into topics that even some Muslims may not have come across. But nonetheless, that's why the next 25 minutes I'm here to provide some light and shed great light on some of the issues. So without further ado, the Qur'an states it is emphatically the word of God. There's no question in it. God says this is his word. It makes the case emphatically. And it says that if it were from other than God, you would have found many contradictions. And if you are in doubt, then produce something like it. We don't have time tonight to explore all the issues. So I do want to just touch on the primary issues tonight. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God says in the Quran, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun. We have revealed this Quran, which he called a dhikr, and we will preserve it and guard it. And that is a reality that has stood the test of history and the test of time, no doubt. Now, the Quranic manuscripts, 100% scientifically, there is no question in it. There are over two dozen confirmed first century manuscripts. In other words, non-Muslim academics have looked into the manuscripts that are extant. That word extant, the third last word from the right there. Extant means existing, we have them. They are in existence right now. 100% of manuscripts from the Qur'an are in existence to this date, and they date back to the first century. Dr. Sidki, Mr. Van Puren, Dr. Sean Anthony, whilst I don't agree with many of these scholars on many issues, but on this issue, I do agree that in fact, we have 100% of the Qur'an in extant manuscript witnesses from the first century of Islam, even though I do disagree with them about many other things. So where are they? Well, the top copy manuscript in Istanbul, you have the Codex Parisino, the Codex BL or 2165, so on and so forth. There is the Yemeni script, which I'm sure Samuel is going to mention C1. I'm going to talk about that in great depth. But the bottom line is the entire Quran without dispute is attested to in multiple manuscripts that date back to the first century Hijra. That's scientifically. This is not my research. It's non-Muslim academic research that says that's where it dates back to. Do we have texts that go back all the way to the Uthmani script? Let's find out. In contrast, 0% of the New Testament manuscripts are found in the new century, in the first century. 0%. Scientifically, zero. There's not a single manuscript that date back to the first century. You have P52, you have P104, we're going to talk about these a little bit later. But the bottom line is that there is no New Testament manuscripts that goes back 
to the first century. And we're being generous if we say early second century. We're talking about mid to late second century, third century. We're talking about preservation. So how do you say, and this is, I'm sort of going to go on a tangent here. How do you say colour? How do you spell it? Do you spell the word colour with O-R or O-U-R? How do you say the word garage? Garage or garage? Do you say the team is playing like in American English or do you say the team are playing? Because in British English, they treat the collective nouns as a plural. How do you say it? You know, English is interesting. In fact, all languages are interesting because they all have variations, every single one of them. All languages have different variations and the Quran has a different variation. It has its own variations. The Quran was revealed in Arabic language. It too has multiple revealed recitations. What does that mean? The Quran has multiple revealed recitations? Absolutely. Why is that a surprise? Why is it a shock when we know that God spoke to prophets in their own language? God's speech is not bound. It's unlimited. He can say a verse and he can also reveal it. He's the author. He can say what he likes. Multiple revealed recitations and he is the author of that. God is the author of all of them and his speech is unlimited. I'm just going to give you a few examples. But before I do, just talk about this point here. The Quran is not uniformic. It's a multiformic text. What does that mean, multiformic, as I just read? I'll give you an example about Surah Al-Fatiha. So Surah Al-Fatiha here, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, Maliki Yawmiddin. That word that I just highlighted in the red, Maliki Yawmiddin, can also be read as Malik. Maliki Yawmiddin. But God revealed it that way. Malik and Malik. So Malik, the king, Malik the king, Malik the owner. God revealed it that way. Seven recitals, seven ahruf, seven different modes. More recitals, there's up to 10 confirmed recitals from the Prophet, but he revealed every single one of them. Sirata, the sod can be read as a seen. Alayhim can be read alayhum. This is all part of God's revealed revelation. The Quran is multiformic, not uniformic. So an atheist and orientalist will say, see, I found something in your hadith that doesn't correspond with this verse. Who said the, who said the Quran is uniformic? It's multiformic revealed recitations. Amr ibn al-Khattab, look at the first hadith. And by the way, every single one of you should have the pamphlet I've given tonight. So when Samuel brings up his rebuttals, you know how to counter him exactly. The hadith of Amr ibn al-Khattab and Hisham. Hish Amr ibn al-Khattab, he hears Hisham read in a particular way. Amr ibn al-Khattab, he says, why are you reading it like that for? You know what Amr does to Hisham, the Sahabi? He grabs Hisham. He grabs him by the throat. He doesn't just bring him to Rasulullah. He drags him to Rasulullah. He said, read it in front of the Prophet right now. The Prophet said to Hisham, read it. And he read it. The Prophet said, that's how it was revealed. He said to Amr, read it. Amr read it. The Prophet said, that's how it was revealed. Look in the top corner. The Prophet didn't capitulate. The Prophet confirmed. These are revealed recitations. The example is out of the Fatiha. Same happened to Ubay ibn Ka'ab. Ubay ibn Ka'ab read a particular verse and then he was confused because the Prophet said, but it was revealed this way too. This is not a surprise. This is in our literature, always has been and never changes the meaning and the meanings are always the same and there's seven different modes. No Muslim scholar disputed this and in fact it was something that was always known. So you have a particular person who might say to you, uh, an atheist or uh, a, a, a orientalist who say, see, I found something in your scripture, it doesn't conform. Well, there's multiple, it's multiformic, not uniformic. What I should add to that is no words or phrases were changed, but sometimes there were character changes. So I'll give you an example. Hafs, Warsh, Kalun, all of them. They say, every single one of them, 99.999% exactly the same because Uthman sent them out without dots or vowels. But out of the characters, God revealed it that way. In some of the, in some of the ayat, in some of the, in some of the speeches that we have, my apologies for that, let me just go back there. So we have here at the bottom of this slide here, we have an example of huwa al-ghani, which is a character difference, or al-ghani, or fa bima kasabat, or bima kasabat. How did Uthman cater for that? 
How was it catered for when he sent, when he sent out the Mus'haf? We'll cover that in a moment. But as we look in terms of the meanings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kudhibu or Kudhibu. If you have a look at the meaning in the first one on my left, they assumed they were lied to or they were certain they were rejected. You know what's interesting about the different recitations? It adds another brilliant dynamic to the meaning without contradicting the meaning. And this is what is phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Why did God do that? Why did he create this sense of or different recitations? Because it teaches us A, about his speech, but B, also practicality. In the time of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, there were many, many people who could not read or recite. They were an illiterate people. If we see in the hadith where the Prophet Wasallam says, I was sent to a, to a nation of illiterates. They can't read or write. So Jibreel replied, command them to recite the Quran in the seven ahruf, the different modes of reading. There's no fog or confusion here. The Prophet revealed them in that manner. It was on his tongue and Allah, God was the author. Bring me any hadith and say, see, the Quran doesn't conform. Every single one of them has an explanation. The pamphlet that should be handed out, you should have it at your disposal. Why do we have them? To make it easy, to deepen the meeting, or to tighten the challenge to non-believers. The variations are all consistent, but God says if you're in doubt, produce a surah, even with the, with the different recitations. To this date, nothing, nobody has ever been able to challenge the Quran. The seven ahruf, they revolve around script, pronunciation, structure, pronouns, so on. We're not gonna get into that. I think I made my point and we don't have a lot of time. But there are other examples, but we just don't have time to go through them. 10 masters of recitation all go back to the Prophet. They're all authenticated, each and every single one of them. One Quran in Arabic, that one Quran. So when Samuel gets up here, as he's done before, and says, Hafs, Warsh, Qalun, and there's differences. When he does that, there is zero difference between them. They are all revealed recitations. They are, there are several recitations, multiformic, not uniformic. There is but one single Qur'an, but there is a way that you can read a particular verse. Say for example, if there's a different vowel on the actual word, if you strip away all the vowels, it looks 99.999% exactly the same with the separation of 43 characters, like a sod and a scene out of 374,000 different characters. Let's move on. Abu Bakr in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had to compiled the Qur'an because the Prophet had passed away. There was an incident that occurred, people passed away. Amr came to the to Abu Bakr. They, com they came and they commissioned Zayd ibn Thabit. Zayd ibn Thabit is critical because Zayd ibn Thabit was the chief scribe of the Prophet and he was there at the final revision when Jibreel came to the Prophet Muhammad. He was there. So they commissioned Zayd ibn Thabit. Abu Bakr's script wasn't fixed, so the open ta and a closed ta, it's just a way of script. Uthman, what motivated Uthman? Muslims now at this stage had grown more than a million in number. They'd spread out and they were everywhere. So Uthman here, given that people spread out, not everybody had memorized the different recitations. So Uthman wants to standardize the, the bulk reading. And there is a dominant reading that exists. So the Uth, and, and a particular orthography. An orthography is a particular script, the way that it's written. So Uthman sets out on a task. The task that he does, what does he do? He appoints a codex committee. He, every parchment is to come forward. Every bit of, of writing that was written in the time of the Prophet was to come forth. It was restriction in how they spelt it in his Mus'haf. Uthman prepared an independent copy. It was checked against the copy that was put together in the time of Abu Bakr. And then at the end, he checks it against the memorizers. Hundreds of companions. He reads it then in front of them. It was read to all the companions. Imagine, he went through each and every one of those steps. Then the parchments after that, everything that existed were to be handed in, rubbed out or destroyed. The Yemeni copy, because the under copy, it seems to be rubbed out. Samuel is gonna attempt to use that tonight, but I'll wait and then I'll, I'll rebut him in my, when, when we come to it. What, what does Uthman do? He prepared seven other copies and he distributed to the provinces. But look what else he does. He sends a reciter which each Mus'haf to every province. He sends Zayd ibn Thabit to Medina. He doesn't just send it. He sends a master reciter. 
There were no dots or vowels or vowels. So he accommodates for every single revealed recitation out there. Also, it was, don't forget, it was, an oral, it was primarily an oral tradition. It was both oral and written, but primarily the Arabs at the time, it was an oral tradition. Zayd ibn Thabit was a memorizer. Why did he take the time to get in all the witnesses and all the parchments? Do you know why? He wanted to reconcile two things, the written with the oral. They were relentless. They were specific. Take away the dots. As we said, we've, we've said this point. We don't need to stay here anymore. Zayd ibn Thabit. Why then did he add, not, why didn't he put all the characters in one book? Do you know why? I'll tell you why. Say, for example, the example I gave about Sirat. He doesn't add the scene, that letter scene, in the, sod, in the same book. Do you know why? I'll tell you why. According to Zayd ibn Thabit, he said, if I put it next to the, if I put one letter, one character next to another, it will confuse the readers. That's number one. He said, number two, if I put it in a footnote, what will happen is people will assume that that reading is lesser than that reading, is less authentic. To do it justice, he said, having a scene in here and a sod in here is equal value. He did the just thing. 43 characters revealed that way. There is only one Quran, only character differences. No phrases, no verses, no words. Right, so that's something very important to remember. The modern approach of textual criticism, we don't have time to go through all of this, but it's worth repeating what we've just said. Of man's tradition, therefore, he took the best of the best of the best. Dr. Sidki, he said, a philogenic analysis confirms the Muslim narrative. Uthman sent the texts out, right, and they were subsequently, subsequently copied. He took from the eyewitnesses that were there at the time. The physical evidence shows that they had four ancestral codices, with the exception of the Sana or the Yemeni palimpsest, which we'll get to. But they all say Van Puren, Sidki, uh, Sinai, who's a non-Muslim German professor, upheld the, uh, the essential historical veracity of the Muslim narrative. Now, this is a very important point here. Van Puren says, if you look at UT, which stand down the bottom, which stands for the Uthmani script or the Uthmani text, and all IM, C1, C2, C3, Van Puren said that was all the companions, and the P is for prophet. They all share, if you look at the first line in the paragraph at the top, all extant physically existing manuscripts today descend from a singular text type. That is scientific. That's not my work. That is their work. New Testament analysis. Let's go through the New Testament. Out of the 8,000 manuscripts, 0% date back to the first century. It was written in the Greek language. Jesus didn't speak Greek. He spoke Hebrew, but not Greek, which means by the time that we have the, all the manuscripts, every manuscript of the New Testament, in fact, of scripture, scripture is in Greek, not Hebrew, which means it was a very, very long time after. People don't give up their languages that easily to say, I've got my language, but I'm gonna give it up and speak another language. Further, secondary writings, you've got the Clement of Rome, Ignatius and Poly, uh, Polycarp, so on and so forth. All of these people were accused, like Clement, for example, never cited the New Testament. Ignatius was accused of forgeries. All they have, second century writings. Anyway, the bottom line is there were no eyewitnesses. New Testament scripture, there was no original manuscript. There are no connected chains of transmission. We have a connected sanad muttasil marfu'ah, as we say in Arabic, a sanad that is connected to the Prophet. They've got none, nothing connected. There's no oral transmission or written transmission. They've got major differences in meaning, in historical events, in facts and events, in, in fact, in theology, major differences, major additions, complete deletions by text by the human beings and scribes, complete additions of text by human beings and scribes, no manuscript date back to the first century, and the Christianity was voted on in the Council of Nicaea in 325. What does that mean it was voted on? Do you know how many competing rival groups there were on Christianity before 325? Ignatius in 324, who was a Roman Catholic, who had power and, and obviously he prestige and so on and so forth. And Bar Ehrman will talk all about this. Bar Ehrman will talk about this. It's a top book to get the orthodox corruption of scripture. I advise every single person to read this book by Bar Ehrman, the orthodox corruption of scripture. It's a phenomenal book. And also how Jesus became God. How did he become God? Do you know why he wrote this book? Because prior to 325, they didn't believe Jesus was God. How did he all of a sudden become God? So as we move on, the oldest Greek manuscript, as we said, is P52, dates back to the second century, nearly 100 years after Jesus. 600, 
6,000 Greek manuscripts. I know I said 8,000 previously, but what they mean here, 6,000 Greek manuscripts, but with no two pages being identical. The famous Alexandrian uh, origin, he said, negligence of some copyists or through, the, through the, the, the perverse audacity of others, what they did, they lengthen or shorten as they please. This is not me saying it. Look at Metza, right? So Metza here, the text of the New Testament by one great scholar called Metza. Have a look. This is what they're saying, not me, their own uh, people or faith adherents. We get into the timeline. If we have a look at the timeline, we're at the second from the last where it says data manuscript, 125 years for John, 150 years for Matthew, 175 years for Luke, 100, 250 years for Mark. Massive break in the chain of evidence. If you're a juror and you're seeing a break in the chain of evidence for two centuries, how do you accept that? The epistemology of history dictates that you don't accept it as proof. You know, there's no recorded instance in the entire history of the Romans that Jesus existed. Do we say, therefore, because it's not mentioned in history, therefore we shouldn't accept it? It's not mentioned in the history. Philosophy, the epistemology of history, epistemology of philosophy, very important for us to understand. So, no eyewitnesses. The, this is what Bart Irma says. The Gospels of the New Testament. I didn't say this, Bart Irma says, the Gospels of the New Testament do not claim to be eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus. Who produced them? Who wrote them? Historians have long recognized that they were produced by third generation Christians. They were speaking a different language, Greek. They lived in different countries than what Jesus did. They experienced different situations. They addressed different audiences. Please get your hands on a copy of that book. Also, we look at what Bar Ehrman says. He says that in fact, there's no repositories of data. In fact, there's no eyewitness testimonies, no objective descriptions of events. They, they just try and make stuff up about theological events, and that's why they're called Gospels, because they mean good news, but they're not factual. Authors are known. If we have a look at 32 scholars and 50 cooperating Christian domination, uh, denominations, who are the authors? Nobody knows. Who's Samuel? Who, who's the author of Samuel? Kings, Jobs, Judges, Chronicles, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and Probable. But who are the authors? They're unknown. How can you accept a statement on probability or likelihood? So Justin Mara, he says that they're memoirs. He calls them the memoirs. He's, a, he's one of the greatest New Testament scholars. Luke openly states that they're not eyewitnesses. Bar Irma says they are nameless, face, uh, faceless subscribers of the text that can be discerned only from what they chose to reproduce. This is not me saying it. Council of Nicaea, who won? Ultimately, the most influential, powerful, dominant group won the day. Each of these groups in that time had their own sacred scriptures, allegedly written by apostles that supported their beliefs and practices. They had their own leaders and they tried to advance their own thoughts. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting because some of the, the, the gospel fathers like that were, that were in charge of the Roman Catholic Church at the time, very influential. In 325, they wrote their own documents. It's no coincidence that by 325, 324, 325 at that council, they were voted in. But before that, you know what orthodoxy today was considered? Heretical. Heretical. You know what heretic is? It's like we would say the equivalent in, in, in Arabic of kufr. That's how they deemed it back then. But once it became orthodoxy, it turned something one thing into another. But some believed in one God, two gods, 30 gods. Jesus was a normal man. Jesus was divine. Jesus was two beings, so on. Ehrman says, it's don't, Ehrman says, historians have now redefined this group not to mean those who were right, but those who won. That's what it was about. Christian orthodoxy today is not about they were right. It's about who won. And, that was the re and that's the reality in that facet. Then we have Eusebius, third century. And it was all about Eusebius. He was the Roman bishop. Sorry, I might have put Ignatius instead of Eusebius earlier, but it was Eusebius who was the Roman bishop who wrote the history of Christian conflicts from the church, and he attempted to, pay, to portray Christianity in a certain light in the year 324, right before 325. Very, very influential. But you know, they declared his writings to be an utter forgeries, Eusebius. There's a lot to say about him in those books that I've suggested earlier. What are the theological implications? The Trinity. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. They got rid of it. That was in the first epistle of John. They threw it out. 30 Christian denominations threw it out. They mentioned God being in the Trinity. Imagine this. 
it was retained by King James Version but removed by the New, the New International Version because they said it was a fraud. How do you remove the Trinity, which is the primary article of faith in your, in your, in your religion? How do you remove it? How do you get rid of it? On what basis? You threw out the Trinity. And that's the only thing in the gospel that talks about the Trinity. But they said it was a manual insertion. Shouldn't have been there. And they threw it out. What was it? Deemed the fabrication by 30 denominations, not in the earliest Greek manuscript. The Church of Father doesn't even quote it. Wasn't even quoted. And the bottom line, they changed to suit the ideological beliefs at the time. Not God. Scholars have long held. And this again, how did Jesus become God in this text? The view that Christ, so-called divine in the Gospel of John, was a later development in the Christian faith. Not original. It was a later development that was spawned, but not originally there. I don't want to talk about Paul too much. We don't have time. But the discrepancies. Who went to the tomb? One minute. Who went to the tomb? These are what we call real discrepancies. Was it Mary only, Mary another, Mary, Mary Magdalene, or the women who accompanied? Whom or what did they see? All differences in historical events, right? What were they told? Again, complete and utter differences in every gospel. Who shouldered the cross? Was it Simon of Cyrene? Was it Jesus himself? Who was it? Or was it that came upon a man of Simon of, Simon of Cyrene? At what time did they crucify Jesus? One said at the sixth hour, one said at the third hour. We're not talking about variations in Greek. We're talking about egregious errors in, in factual events. What did Jesus say? Did he speak or not? Again, discrepancy after discrepancy after discrepancy, which we don't have time. Christopher Tuckett, he says, it seems impossible that we are presented with equally authentic counts of Jesus' life. You just can't get it. It cannot happen. Brothers and sisters, guess if you are genuine, and this will be my final point, if you are genuine and you are here seeking the truth, consider what I have put before you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sheikh Wassam. Would like to move on to Samuel's opening statement. Well, welcome everyone this evening. And I want to echo what's said before, that I hope tonight you will look at the evidence and uh, not follow conspiracy theories, but you'll actually look at the evidence that's presented and follow it up. I want to thank the organisers for putting this together and for uh, meeting up with Hussam again. It's always great to be with him. Why are we discussing the subject of the preservation of Scripture? Well, it's because Islamic leaders... Uh, say to Christians and to the world uh, the following message when they teach Islam. They say that the Bible has been corrupted. The Bible's been changed. And they blame Christians for this. They say that we're guilty of this. They also say that there's uh, one Quran and that it's been preserved and it's directly from Muhammad. It's been memorised and passed on directly to the Muslim community today. I was uh, here early and I had to get some lunch and I walked past a dawa table and there were some leaflets that were being given out there and that they say this exact type of thing that I'm saying here. And so uh, the, the, the idea of this message in Islam is to turn people away from the Bible and I think you've just seen that with, with Sam there. He actually wants you to turn away from the Bible and instead of reading the books of the prophets so like Moses and David and Isaiah, Jeremiah, instead of reading those prophets just to listen to one man, Muhammad, and what he tells you about the prophets. So this is the message. The Bible's wrong. You don't, go, don't read the prophets yourself. Just listen to one man who will tell you what they mean. And so th this is what Christians hear. This is what Christians get accused from, uh, accused of uh, by our Muslim friends and, and other people. And so today, I want to defend the Bible against these attacks. And I also want to show that what's said about the Quran actually doesn't match up to what Muslims are commonly taught. We've had some of that presented today from with Sam, and I'm going to be looking at that uh, again. So here is my, the structure of my talk. You can see it up there. We'll look at uh, has the Quran been memorised? Has it come from Muhammad? The standardising of the Quran, the Quraat, and then I'll look at the, the, uh, the Bible, and then I'll look at what the Quran says about the Bible. So let's get straight into it. Has the Quran been memorised? This is something which, as I said, is, brought, uh, is said in these leaflets, and it's, when, uh, it's what Muslims assure people of. However, when you read the Quran, it actually says that parts were forgotten. 
He will make you recite, O Muhammad, and you will not forget except what Allah should will. We do not abrogate a verse or cause it to be forgotten except when we, we bring forth something better or similar to it. So the Quran never says that it's been remembered. It says that some parts have been forgotten, but it was Allah's will. Aisha reported that the apostle of Allah listened to the recitation of the Quran by a man in the mosque. Thereupon he said, may Allah have mercy upon him. He reminded me of the verse which I'd been made to forget. In fact, when you read through the Sahih Hadith, there are many examples of entire surahs being forgotten. We used to recite a surah which resembled in length and severity to Surah 9. I have, however, forgotten it, with the exception of, of this which I remember out of it. If there were two valleys of riches, full of riches, the son of Adam would long for a third valley, and nothing would fill his stomach of the son of Adam but dust. And of course, that's not in the Quran, but this is uh, something now. Surah 9 has got, uh, I think, 129 verses. It's a big surah. It's not in the Quran anymore. Here's a summary statement from uh, Umar. Abdullah ibn Umar reportedly uh, reported, said, Let none of you say, I have got the whole of the Quran. How does he know what all of it is? Much of the Quran is gone. Let him say instead, I have got what has survived. So uh, again, I'm not trying to push anything here. Like, I I'm simply trying to say, what does the Quran and Hadith say? And it never makes this claim that the Quran's been remembered. It just doesn't make that claim. In fact, it makes the opposite claim. It says that it wasn't preserved, but that the parts that were forgotten were Allah's will. Now, and that's a different thing, isn't it? That's a, that's a different statement to make. Now, did the Quran come directly from Muhammad? Well, narrated Zayd bin Thabid. Therefore, I, Umar, suggest that you, Abu Bakr, order that the Quran be collected. I said to Umar, how can you do something which Allah's apostle did not do? This is from Sahih Bukhari. Very clear that Muhammad did not make a collection of the Quran. Abu Bakr kept on urging me, Zaid, to accept his idea, that is to collect the Quran, until Allah opened my chest for the idea. So I started looking for the Quran and I collected it from what was written on palm stalks, white stones, and also from the men who knew it by heart. That is, there's no autograph from Muhammad. Uh, there's the, uh, the book over there on textual criticism of the New Testament and it talks about the autograph and it says there is an autograph for the different documents in the Bible, in the, in the, in the New Testament. But there is no autograph from Muhammad. Muhammad never made a collection. Instead, it was up to his companions to make collections. And what I'm going to say now is, is very well documented. So Ubay, um, Ubay ibn Kaab had 116 surahs in his collection. Abdullah ibn Masud had 110 surahs in his collection. Again, this is just in the standard Islamic textbooks that you can get. The surahs were arranged differently, which is precisely what you'd expect if Muhammad hadn't made a collection himself. His disciples, his followers would make their own collections. And there were different words for the same verse. There were, in effect, synoptic Qurans. And they were used by the different companions in the different regions where they went out with the Islamic conquests. So here's a couple of examples. In the standardised Quran, we read, the prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves, and his wives are their mothers, Surah 33, verse 6. But in Ubay ibn Kabs, it reads, the, father, the prophet is closer to the believers than their own selves, and he is a father of them, and his wives are their mothers. Now, that's not a dialectical difference, is it? That's actually a, a difference of saying, Muhammad is your father. And there's actually quite significant theological differences to that. And this actually just comes out of Abdullah Yusuf Ali's Quran. So it's just in the footnotes of Abdullah Yusuf Ali's Quran there. Um, uh, Abdullah ibn Masud, he recited the Quran as by the male and the female for that verse, whereas in the standard Quran, it's by him who created the male and the female. In fact, Here's the reference to Abdullah ibn Masud not accepting the last surahs in the, what is now the standard Quran. Narrated Azir bin Hubaysh, I met Ubay ibn Kaab and said to him, Ibn Masud used to remove the verses of refuge from the Quranic codices, saying both of them are not part of the Quran. These are the last surahs of the Quran. 
um, and do not include it in it, uh, in what it is, which is not part of it. Now, Ubay ibn Kaab, sorry, Abdullah ibn Masud, who is he? He is the one who first recited the Quran in Mecca. He is the one who recited the Quran to Muhammad. He is the main reciter of the Quran. He's a big, a big reciter. He's number one. He's the number one reciter. Now, how is this, uh, the, the, these different collections of the Quran, these led to problems. Narrated Anas bin Malik, who they for bin al Yemen came to Uthman when the people, uh, the Muslims of Syria and Iraq, were waging war to conquer Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uthman was afraid of the Muslims of Syria and Iraq and their differences in the recitation of the Quran. He didn't think it was a good thing. He wasn't saying Allah allowed all these good things. He's saying, now this is a problem. So he said to Uthman, O chief of believers, save this nation before they differ about the book. Therefore, and then Uthman makes a standard Quran, and then Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. And so here is how the Quran is standardised through a wholesale empire-wide burning of the Qurans to standardise one text. And this is why we don't have the codex of Abdullah ibn Masud. This is why we don't have the codex of Ubay ibn Kaab because they were destroyed by Uthman. Now, Abdullah ibn Masud, who I said was a, is, is the, the one who first preaches, uh, uh, recites the Quran in, the, in, in Mecca, he recites the Quran to Muhammad, he did not accept Uthman's actions. So there's actually no consensus with the Uthmatic Quran. Abdullah ibn Masud reported that he said to his companions to conceal their copies of the Quran. And further said, after whose mode of recitation do you command me to recite? I in fact recited before Allah's apostle more than 70 chapters of the Quran. And the companions of Allah's messenger know that I have a better understanding of, the, of, 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 a better understanding of the book of Allah than they do. So here is him, the, Uthman's messengers have come to Iraq and they're telling uh, Abdullah ibn Masud that he can't recite according to his codex anymore. And he's telling his disciples to hide their Qurans. There is no consensus with Uthman's actions. Now, the Quran that Uthman sent out, and here's a picture of one of the ancient Quran, uh, old Qurans. You can see there there's no dots or dashes. And what happened was... In the first four centuries of Islam, people put the dots and dashes in a whole range of places and there were dozens and dozens of different ways of putting the dots and dashes in their place. So in the fourth Islamic century, it was Ibn Mujahid who standardised seven, uh, seven versions, seven ways of putting the dots and dashes in there. But there were many, there were dozens and dozens of different uh, ways of doing it. And then he made another standardising, this is the second major standardising, to standardise seven different re recitations, and then three more were added. Now, what are these differences? Well, as we've pointed out, here are two of these Qurans. There's, uh, the, there are ten of them. I've only got two here. There's the Quran according to Imam Hafs and according to Imam Warish. Now, what type of differences are we looking at? Well, there's, you can see the differences here. Takulana or Yakulana. So that changes it from you say to they say. That changes the subject of who's talking, doesn't it? It's not a dialectical difference. Kala or Kul. That changes it from he said. So for, for this sentence, Muhammad is the, is the subject. Kul is say. It's actually a command to Muslims. It's a completely different uh, meaning to the verse. This one changes it completely. The middle word there in, in, uh, with uh, the Hafs Quran is uh, a noun, and it's the word for slave. So it's, they are slaves of the most gracious, whereas in the other one, it's a preposition. They are with the gracious. That's a completely different meaning to the verse. So these are not dialectical differences between them. They, they are just different words. And then in the last one, uh, uh, it goes from the active to the pa passive. Many a prophet killed or many a prophet was killed. Well, which is it? Is it he was killed or he did kill? That's the exact opposite meaning. Now, if you want to say, oh, well, they're all true, well, then it, it, where's the consistency in that? 
Does the verse mean one thing or does the verse mean opposite things? Again, uh, th these are not uh, dialectical differences between them. These are actual differences in meaning, differences in words. Now, what's interesting is that the word Quran means recitation. That's what the word means. It means recitation. But each of the different Qira'ats, each of those different Qurans that I showed you, they're their own recitation. So the word Quran means recitation, and each of those books that we Sam held up is its own unique recitation. That means there's not one Quran. You can't say there's one recitation when there's 10 authorised recitations. You, you just can't say that. You can't say there's one and there's 10 at the same time because each one is its own recitation. Uh, uh, Fidel Solomon has actually made a, a helpful translation and you may like to get this, you can uh, buy it from his website, from the Bridges website. And he actually puts the differences between the different Qurans in red. And so you can go through and you can actually highlight those. And, um, and so you can actually count them. So I counted them in preparation. And there's 965 variants and 77,915 words in the Hafs Quran. So it's basically 1% of variation. 1% variation. Now, I actually want to say, as a Christian, I'm not particularly, you know, it's not my message to go around saying, oh, the Quran's corrupted, the Quran's corrupted. That's not our message as Christians. When we explain the gospel, we don't talk about the Quran. And so I'm not particularly, you know, wanting to say it's corrupted or anything, but I'm saying it, to say that it's, you know, perfectly memorized. Well, that's not what your sources say. To say that there's only one of them, well, there's 10 of them. There's all these variations which have these different meanings. There's wholesale burnings. There's a uh, number one companion saying, I don't agree with this. I don't agree with, with this, this standardising. So it, I, I have no problem in saying that the Quran is a good record of what Muhammad recited, but to say that it's absolutely perfect and that it's better than everything else, well, you just don't get that from that evidence. I want to move on to the Bible now. Now, what is the Bible? Um, the Bible's not one book, it's a collection of many books from many prophets over about a 1500 year period. It has the law of Moses, the books of many prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. It has the Psalms of David and the, the books that come with the gospel. Uh, the evidence that we have for the preservation of the Bible comes from the ancient copies, from the ancient translations and the ancient quotes that we get for, beginning within the New Testament itself within the early church fathers, and strangely, even with uh, apocryphal gospels that were written, they, they quote the, the earlier gospels, and so we, we use those. We actually have a lot of evidence that we can use. We have many manuscript evidence going right back to the early centuries. It's true that there's earlier material for the Quran, but remember the Quran's a medieval book. The, the New Testament's a, an ancient book. So we're, we're talking you know, 600 years difference here. And so you wouldn't expect to get the same amount of evidence. But the evidence we have is uniform. And it shows that the Bible has been well preserved. And scholars use this. Now, I'll show you how they do this. Let me get up to this. So if you get a, a Greek New Testament, what they do in the Greek New Testament is they, they get all of these different manuscripts, all of these different ancient translations, and they basically line them out and compare them and they see what family groups they go in, and they just work their way along, word by word, letter by letter, and because they've got manuscripts from different locations, uh, independent of each other, they can actually compare them. And so if, if there was a change, that change can be spotted because you can compare manuscripts in one area with manuscripts in another. And this is called textual criticism. And we don't just do it with the Bible, we do it with any ancient book. So if you're reading you know, a Roman history or Greek history or, or anything before the printing press, and even interestingly after the printing press, people still do, people have to do textual criticism. And so I've given you a page here, and down the bottom is where they give their evidence for, what they, uh, for, 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 for where the text is, and they can establish it um, you know, with great confidence. Now, how many variants are we talking about? Because you'll sometimes hear people say, there's hundreds of thousands of variants. People like Bart Ehrman will say, there are hundreds of thousands of variants uh, to the Bible, or, and so you know, there's more variants than there are for words in the New Testament. But 
they're very similar to what we've seen with some of the examples in the Quran, in that there may just be a different way of spelling the same word. And so that doesn't really count as a variant, that's just the, the, a, a different way of writing that word when it's the same word. The, the number of variants which is, are meaningful and need to be considered, as you can see from this quote here, it says the evaluation of all 1,438 sets of variants uh, cited in the apparatus have been completely reconsidered. That is, when you come to look at a, a technical work, a technical book on the New Testament, they're saying there's 1,438 variants that need to be considered. Now, how does that, uh, you know, let's, let's get some numbers here. There's 138,020 words in the New Testament, so that's about 1.1, uh, it's basically 1%, 1%. And so this is what scholars do. When scholars look at the New Testament, they have plenty of material to work with. So again, if you get that Bruce Metzger book, he says in that, that the people who work on the New Testament are embarrassed by the amount of material they have compared to people who, in the, who do other ancient books. Because for other ancient books, they have very, very little information, very little ancient copies, whereas for the New Testament, they've got a lot. And so if you read that book, it's a very positive book. It's not a negative book, it's a positive book about how we can do what's called textual criticism on the Bible, that is, looking at all the ancient manuscripts and confirming what we've got. And we can see from that that the Bible, that New Testament has been well preserved. So just a comparison, we're both actually about 1% variants. So when you look at the Quran and you look at the accepted variants amongst the 10 Qur'ats, it's about 1%. And then when you look at the New Testament, which is a bigger book, but it's got more variants, it's about 1% as well. So again, I guess all I'm saying here is let's just not exaggerate about these things. Let's not just state more about our religion than the religion actually teaches. Now, what does the Quran say about the Bible? Well, the Quran actually upholds the Bible as the word of God. And there are many, many verses about this. I'm just going to look at a few and I'll, we'll see if we can discuss it later on. Say, we believe in God and what was revealed to us, that is the Quran, and what was revealed to Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Jacob and the tribes, and in what was given to Moses and Jesus, and in what was given to the prophets from their Lord. We make no distinction between any of them. So you're meant to make no distinction between any of the books. In fact, the Quran even addresses Muhammad in the Muslim community and says to them, if you are in doubt about what we have sent down to you, ask those who, have been, who recited the scripture before you. So Muslims are actually commanded here, or Muhammad was, to actually speak to Christians for a confirmation on the Quran. You can't do that if the Bible's being corrupted. There's a verse which speaks about Jesus and his gospel. We bestowed on him, Jesus, the gospel, in which is a guidance and a light, confirming that which had been revealed before in the Torah, and a guidance and an admonition to those who fear, the, who fear God. Let the people of the gospel judge by what God has sent down in it. So here we have Jesus with his gospel, and who, who, then who does he speak to? The people of the gospel, that's Christians, that's me. And he says, what? You've got to judge by, by the gospel. So the assumption there that of that whole verse is what was given to Jesus is what Christians have and Christians are called to obey. We see it in the next verse. And they say none will enter paradise except the one who is a Jew or a Christian. That is merely their wishful thinking. Say, produce your proof if you should be truthful. See, here's the verse saying, okay, if you're saying only Christians go to paradise, give us your proof. That is, quote it for us. Give us the verses. Well, I can do that. But again, the assumption there is that the Bible is reliable and it's been preserved. I'll go back to that one there. Um, I'll just finish up with this, uh, with, with this statement from um, uh, Abdullah Zaid from Melbourne University. He says, since the authorised scriptures, scriptures of the Jews and Christians remain very much today as they existed at the time of the prophet, it is difficult to argue that the Quranic references to Tawid, the Tarot, and uh, Injil are only to the pure uh, Torah and Injil as existed at the time of Moses and Jesus, respectively. If the texts have remained more or less as they were in the 7th century, the reverence the Quran has shown them at that time should be retained even today. 
The wholesale dismissive attitude held by many Muslims in the modern period towards the scriptures of Judaism and Christianity does not seem to have the support of either the Quran or the major figures of Tafsir. So I just want to say that that's what the Quran says about the Bible. Just go and look up the references. You can Google them, you can find them, and just see what it says, and that it upholds the Bible as the Word of God. So to conclude, I want to say that both books have been well preserved. As a Christian, I'm not particularly against the Quran in trying to say it's, it's changed, but I, when I go and do my own research, I see that Muslims are just exaggerating in what they say about it. And so I'm asking us to not, uh, not exaggerate about it. Uh, don't exaggerate about the Bible. Don't exaggerate about the Quran. Uh, please be aware of what your scholars write. Certainly don't blame Christians for changing the Bible because we haven't done that. We, we haven't changed the Bible. But I, I want to finish up with uh, my, my last point. And, and that is, as I pointed out before, the Bible is not one book. It's a collection of many books from many prophets. So Christians actually read the law of Moses. Christians actually read the Psalms of David. Christians read the book of Jonah. Christians read the book of Job. We don't just read one prophet. And this is what Muslim leaders are trying to turn you away from. They're trying to turn you away from reading the prophets yourself and instead just listening to one man and what he says about the prophets. Now, I just want to encourage you to actually read the prophets. If you say you believe a, the prophet, if you say you believe a prophet, you've got to listen to them. You can't say you believe Moses, but you don't read the Torah. You can't say you believe Jesus, but you're not going to read the gospel. You can't say you believe Jonah, but you're not going to read the book of Jonah. If you just, re if you just listen to one man, then your religion is of one man. But Christianity is based on all of the prophets and what they tell us about God. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Samuel. Uh, let's keep our volume down. We're almost at our break. We're going to have our rebuttal. So we'd like to move on to our speaker rebuttal. As a reminder, each speaker will get seven minutes. Can we keep our volume down from the left? Thank you. So uh, I wanted to give a reminder. So we're going to move on to our rebuttal. They will last for seven minutes each. Um, I'll give a reminder at two minutes, one bell, and uh, a final reminder at 30 seconds, which is two bells. And then on, we'll move on to the next speaker. At that point, seven minutes hits, I'll just repeatedly hit the bell. So let's start with Sheikh Wassam's rebuttal. Just to talk fast, inshallah, so we get this, uh, so we get it all, we address all the points. First of all, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was initially resistant like Zayd ibn Thabit was, even Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was initially resistant. He, I'm glad he quoted the hadith when he said, Abu Bakr said, I won't do what Allah and his prophet didn't do. Hello, you're, you're telling me exactly what I'm telling you. Abu Bakr was resistant because the Prophet sallam, didn't put it in just one text. Zayd ibn Thabit, same thing. He said, I'm not going to do what the prophet didn't do. But in the end, his heart came around, Allah opened his heart and Zayd was the chief scribe. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was exactly the same. Now he says, oh, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was reluctant and so on and so forth. But Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, you can't have an oral chain of transmission of Quran without Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He came to see it. In fact, he taught all of the people in Kufa the Quran, some of the greatest Hanafis that ever emerged, all through Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. That's the chain right there. Abdullah, all transmissions for the primary main transition. If you go back to the Ten Qur'an, they all go back through Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He's neglecting the fact that it was an oral transmission. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was on board. In fact, the manuscripts were considered by the Codex Committee, given to the Codex Committee by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. I love how when people, they take one narration, because Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, of course he was upset. He was in Iraq. Uthman didn't pick him to be part of it. Zayd ibn Thabit was half his age. I'm with the Prophet, why didn't you pick me? It's almost sort of like that. Not that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said that, radiallahu anhu, one of the greatest companions of the Prophet said, take Quran from. But of course, do you think companions were reluctant to voice any criticism they had? Certainly not. Certainly not. But Abdullah ibn Mas'ud was on board without a doubt. All the, the recitations go through him, the transmissions came through him, and it never became an issue in the time of the companions. There's a lot to talk about what we've said in terms of, for
For example, reading the books of the prophets. If we read the books of the prophets, but not through unbroken chains. The biblical scriptures are all broken chains. There's no chain. What is interesting here is, and I say this with due respect, but it's almost a psychological point. You are desperate to find a connected change and you have none. You have no connected change and that is the entire problem. You use the qira'at and the ahruf which make no difference to preservation. You didn't even talk about the scientific aspect of it. This is problematic. The ahruf and the qira'at have zero impact on preservation. Yet I started off with that tonight expecting what he was going to say and because I know a Muslim audience sometimes cannot be across it altogether. There's abrogation as well in the Quran. You know, there's a lot that we can talk about. I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to go off the side. I'm just going to go off here. Abrogation is something that does exist in Islam. It was all done through the prophetic tongue. The Prophet ﷺ did that. It was all through his prophetic tongue. Bukhari was misrepresented. This is a common, common error that people make about Bukhari when he was quoting the verse and they mis completely misrepresent the hadith of Bukhari. Please see me after. Please take this handout. All of the criticisms that, he, that he's put in there, I've replied to you. Whether he talks about the Fatiha and other surahs, they're all in there. Please read them, I urge you to. Also, Ubay ibn Ka'ab and other companions, no autograph of the Prophet. The Prophet Sallallahu Every single time something was revealed, he called a scribe. Of course it may have occurred that a scribe didn't have the entirety of the Qur'an with him, but the entirety of the Qur'an was recorded. He said, yeah, but in some, not this companion had the entirety of Qur'an. He didn't need to. The Prophet didn't have one scribe. He had many, many, many scribes. Many scribes. He said, but, yeah, but he didn't have it. By the way, just so he knows, you know, there's some things were mentioned in one part, another part. You know, the, the scribes, the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi you know what they did? Their Qur'ans was for their own personal use. They used to write in it as part of tafsir. It wasn't meant to be official copies. And so something that he has to understand is, for example, Ibn Mas'ud didn't have the Fatiha in his codex. Does that mean he didn't accept the Fatiha as being part of the Qur'an? How did he recite in front of all his, Qur all the, his students? What did he recite? He started off with the Baqarah and not the Fatiha? Logic tells you that obviously, and all of the students that took from him, let him bring up the Fatiha, you have it here, please at your disposal, please have a read. Then when we talk about, for example, Abu Bakr was resistant, of course he was. And then he says, yeah, but the surahs were arranged differently. Of course they were arranged, dif arranged differently. It, it confirms over a 23 intermittent revelation that was coming on the Prophet over 23 years. The Prophet didn't just get one book and say, this book, the Quran, khalas, it all comes to me in one fell swoop. It was over a 23 year period. Further to that, some of the things that we're running out of time, we don't have much to say. When he said the male and the female, and, and that God created the male and the female, it doesn't change the crux of the meaning. He gave an example that is certainly in our camp. Also, when he talks about Rothman, uh, and he talks about the recitations and the dots, if you remove, Rothman sent it out without dots or vowels. If you remove the dots or the vowels, the skeleton of the Quran is 99.999% the same. There's no difference except in 43 characters that were revealed, like a hua or a man. You see, that's very, very deceptive to say they're all different. They're exactly the same in their rasm. They call it the rasm, the way that it's written. 99.99% exactly the same. Remove the dots and the vowels. Not a single difference except for those characters that were intentional. They weren't uh, uh, accidental, absolutely intentional. Then he talks about, for example, he talks about Christianity. Bart Ehrman said there was about 400 egregious errors. He didn't address the historical facts, the theological facts, the prophetic facts. He didn't address any of that. Also, he made a comparison between the Bible and, and the Quran. There is no comparison. A connected chain to the Prophet, a connected chain scientifically to the first century. There's nothing that exists in the first, second, or, or but only in the third century of Christianity in terms of biblical statements. Then when we talk about other things, for example, both have been well preserved. What a conflation. You're trying to conflate one with the other, a broken chain compared to an unbroken chain, something that doesn't contradict the meaning, something that directs directly to the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. There is no comparison in any way, shape or form. Further to that, the Basmala, when he talks about the Basmala being part of the Quran or not part of the Quran, let's look at the Codex Committee. Let's not forget the Codex Committee. The Codex Committee that was brought 
by Uthman that Uthman subjected. The Codex Committee were all memorizers. They were all masters of Quran. Sayyid ibn Thabit could have written the whole Quran from memory, but he didn't. Do you know why he didn't? He wanted to reconcile between both. But the Basmala, we might come to that at the end in our conclusion. There's a critical point that I missed, but anyway, it's all good. We'll get there. Khalas. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, uh, we're now going to move on to the seven-minute rebuttal by Samuel Green. Okay. Oh, there we go. Thanks. All right, thank you for that, Wissam. Um, f first of all, I'm really glad to see that Wissam is talking about the different Qur'ats and the differences between them, because that's a fairly new thing in Christian-Muslim dialogue. Up until recently, we were always being told one Qur'an, no variations. And so it's, it's great now that we've made progress and that we're acknowledging that there are these different Qur'ans with these types of differences that we've been discussing. That's actually real progress in our discussions. Um, but Sam has been talking about them as, as multiformic. Well, the, you may want to call it multiformic, but multiformic doesn't mean one, does it? And as I pointed out, the word Qur'an means recitation. That's what the word Qur'an means. And so when you have 10 different recitations, you have 10 different Qur'ans. And so you can't say there's one Qur'an. It's just not logically possible to say that. Wissam spoke about the ancient manuscripts, and so I've got a, some pictures here of the Samarkand manuscript, which was one that he mentioned. But they're not actually identical to the Qur'an that you would have with you today. And so I've just given some differences here. You can see in that gap, there's the word Allah, has been put in the new one, Hua has turned into an Allah, and then there's, in that gap there's a whole range of words there. Now, don't get me wrong, we have the same thing with the New Testament. So I'm not trying to create a false impression here, but what I'm saying is we just need to be honest about this. If we're going to bring up the old manuscripts, then the old manuscripts um, don't... Let me just get out of here. I think I'll um, take this out now. The, the, yeah, it, so uh, what I'm asking is just that we don't go exaggerating about these things. We need to look at our ancient manuscripts and see what they, what they say and to work at it. Now, one of the criticisms that he's had of the Bible is the chain of narration. And he says there's no chain of narration for the different books in the Bible. And to some degree this is true. Not completely, though. If you read um, uh, Irenaeus's Against Heresies, he has a whole section in which he actually gives you the list of names going back to the churches who received the Gospels. So we actually do have our chains of narration, and it is in the early church fathers. It's just not something that we don't use it in the same way that Muslims do. But I also want to say that the chains of narration need to be proven true. For instance, the Quran says 13 times that Muhammad did no miracle. Yet, when you read Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Muhammad's doing all types of miracles. And those miracles have perfect chains of narration. But they're clearly false, even though they've got a perfect chain of narration. So a chain of narration actually doesn't really guarantee anything. There are hadiths which completely contradict the Quran, yet are in, the, uh, are in Bukhari and Muslim with good chains of narration. You need to look at the chain and say, is it historically possible? Now, what I showed was that Abdullah ibn Masud, he didn't want to accept, not that he wasn't against the collecting of the Quran, he'd made his own collection. He didn't want to be t told to recite the Quran in a different way. That was his promise, that was his problem, and that's what we saw in the notes that I showed before. Um, and so, I also gave the hadith where it says that he didn't have the last surahs of the Qur'an. So if you have a chain of narration to a Qur'an that includes those surahs, then it can't be an authentic chain of narration. It's historically not possible. Now, I want to uh, just briefly in my last one minute to look at some things he said about the New Testament. He said Jesus didn't speak Greek. Yes, he did. He spoke to Greek speakers. Uh, he said that there were lots of different groups of Christians. Well, no, there were Gnostic Christians 
and others around, and Gnostic Christians didn't even believe God was the creator. You said that no one believed Jesus was God before AD 325 at the Council of Nicaea. That's just historically wrong. Uh, these beliefs are well documented before then. You mentioned Origen, uh, talking about the, the, the Bible in Metzger's, uh, in the book by Metzger. I've written an article on that. The types of differences uh, Origen gives are the type that I gave. And so they're actually minor things. So you, we're just creating a false impression here. You spoke about uh, the, the idea of uh, the Trinity being removed from the Bible. Well, it wasn't removed from the Bible. 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 is in a Latin translation. It's not in the original language. So we've got to talk about the original language, not just an ancient translation. And finally, you said Justin Martyr said that the, the Gospels are just called memoirs. No, he doesn't. He calls them Gospels in First Apology uh, 66. I think that's my time. Uh, so I will f yep, finish up there. Thank you. <laughs>
You know what is so interesting that scholars have actually a detailed name by name analysis of every Qari who died, and there weren't that many at all. But it was Amar's foresight when he saw that, right, that prompted him to do that. By the way, there were hundreds and hundreds of companions who were Qara, right? Hundreds. In that battle, a small handful passed away. We've got all their names, I can give that to you after. Also, one verse found by Zayd ibn Thabit. What do you mean one Z verse found by Zayd ibn Thabit? See, this is a problem. You look to a hadith, and there, there it is, as Samuel said before, it didn't conform. It wasn't meant to be uniform, because it's multiformic from one author. But in terms of that, that ayah, how did Zayd know that ayah? Zayd knew that, where that ayah was. And that compilation of Uthman was Zayd, was at the first compilation with Abu Bakr, and he was at the second compilation with Uthman. That verse just meant in terms of a scribe being with the Prophet. It was recorded by one scribe who was there in the presence of the Prophet. But by the way, just so you know, right, he reconciled two realities. He would memorized it. All of the Codex Committee had memorized it. But, 30 seconds, but he, he was at the first gathering, the second gathering, but most importantly, when Zaid said that he only found it with one written, in other words, because uh, uh, Uthman said two witnesses, and Abu Bakr said two witnesses, each person that presented with a parchment needed to have two witnesses for what they presented. Two witnesses being in the company of the Prophet. That one verse does not take or mean the literal sense of it. In other words, one scribe being there with the Prophet himself at the time when he took it down. So there's a great meaning behind that verse. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sheikh Wassan. <laughs> Yeah, that was exactly two minutes, trust me. Um, so, any other questions for him? Oh, sorry, for, sorry, any questions for Sam Green? Uh, us, uh, to the lady at the back. So you have exactly one minute to talk. Yeah. Um, hi, Sam. Yeah, I spoke with you earlier. But um, so, like, I was wondering why in your speech you didn't say, like, you didn't quote, like, anything from the Bible. Like, in Hebrews 4, like, in our Bible, it says, Hebrews, Hebrews 4, verse 12, for the word of God is live and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So I was saying, like, you know the Bible front to back probably, but why are you, like, your whole speech was not even... You're, like, speaking about what you don't know, like, the Quran. And, like, this guy, like, he, he knows the Quran because that's what, you know, he believes in. But, like, we believe in the Bible, we know the Bible, you know it, so why didn't you use that? Okay. Um, thank you for your question. Uh, Hebrews 4 verse 12 is a great verse. The Word of God is living and active, judging the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, dividing soul and marrow, the spirits of joint and marrow. I'm all for that. It's just that the topic of tonight's debate was on the preservation of the message of the Bible and of the Quran. And so I wasn't trying to explain what the Bible says. I was wanting to show that it has been preserved as a document. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure what else I can say there. I, was just, I, I just felt that that was the, the topic that I was meant to be addressing. Thank you for that. Uh, any questions for Sheikh Wassam? Uh, to the lady at up the top. Okay, so I'm a Christian, so correct me if I'm wrong about anything that the Quran says. Um, but it says, so the Quran says that the word of Allah cannot be changed. And it also says that the Torah and the Gospels are the word of God. So I was just wondering, how does this align with the claim that the, that the Bible has been corrupted? Excellent question. We believe in the preservation of Scripture, absolutely. God says that we revealed 
the scriptures and the scrolls and the books and we will preserve them. The reality is that the Quran has been preser preserved through what we call at-talaqi al-mutawatir. At-talaqi al-mutawatir. Oral, uninterrupted transmission in mass numbers that precludes the possibility of there being any lie. The problem with the Bible is that it was lost. The original was lost. What you have now is people writing willy-nilly. That's our belief. Or the scribes. Now, whether it was intentional, in some cases it was. It was unintentional. In other cases, I accept. In some cases, unintentional. In some cases, intentional, as we spoke about before. But what we have now is not an original that was changed. As we said and mentioned up there on the screen before, 150 years, 200 years after the fact that people decided to write something and produce something from their own hand. And you know what that meant? The absolute need for a final testament, a last testament, so that God would guide yourself, myself, and every single human being on this planet. So we would conform to a final, last, revealed testament as 1 Corinthians said, for I, God, am not the author of confusion. God is not the author of confusion. Doesn't leave human beings on earth to be confused. So in actuality, what you've said is an excellent question, but the original was lost. That original cannot be corrupted, but what we have is not a copy of that original. We have something that is written by the hands of men, which is specifically told in the Quran. For wailu lilladina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, woe be to those who write with their own hand just to earn some money. And that's exactly, we see that happen, happened over the years and years and years. Thank you for that. Uh, any questions for Chef or Sam? <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. For Samuel, I'm losing track. To the lady on the left. Which one? <laughs> <laughs> So this one's to Samuel. So all of the arguments that you use to prove the Qur'an has contradictions are based on quotes of companions known as a hadith. So my question to you is, can you prove that those quotes have been preserved? And if so, have they been preserved better than the Qur'an? Because if not, it's just a tale of he said, she said. Thank you for the question. So the, I'll, I'll just make sure I've understood it properly for you. So I gave references to Ubay ibn Kab for Surah 33 verse 6 where it says that he read the Quran uh, with a, an extra clause saying that Muhammad is your father. Is this what you're talking about? Honestly, I'm talking about all of them because they're all a hadith in our, in our like, religion. Yeah, so, so the, the, these are the quotes from the hadith that I gave about the variant readings. That's yeah. that, Yes. Well, um, the reason I'm quoting them is because they're in Sahith Bukhari, and so that is seen as an authoritative text. And uh, yes, it's not the Quran. I mean, we've got the differences between the Qur'ats, which I pointed out, you know. So in one, it will say the prophet killed. For exactly the same verse in another, it will say the prophet was killed. So it's got the opposite meaning. So it, it's, it's different to the Quran, but both the Quran and the Hadith are authenticated through the chains of narration. And so they all, you know, the Quran itself has a chain of narration like a Hadith. And so the chains of narration for Bukhari are said to be sound, said to be Sahith. And so that's why I referred to them. I wasn't referring to an obscure collection of Hadith. I was referring to, you know, the main collections. And so um, if, if they're not reliable, then, then they're not reliable, but they're, they're linked up with the same lot of chains that authenticate the Quran. Thank you for that. I'll, now we'll ask a question that's oriented towards both speakers, so both speakers will get two minutes to answer your questions. Does anyone have any questions for both speakers? To the boy at the front. <laughs> 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 Um, <laughs> so, mainly towards Samuel Grain and Sheikh Wissam can give his input. 
Uh, you stated that the Bible had the same tolerance and variation as the Quran, being 1%, and that it was still preserved with 138,020 words. However, since the New Testament is changed on whims, for example, the verse concerning the trilogy, which was included in the King James Version but omitted in the Revised Standard Version, are there still 138,020 words? Because regardless of the variation in the Quran, the same odd 70 to 80,000 words are the same. So we'll go with uh, Samuel Green first. Yeah. Um, so what I did there was I gave an explanation for how I chose my numbers. And I compared the critical editions of the Greek New Testament with the number of variants. And then I compared the number of variants amongst the, 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 the ten kira'at. And so that was my comparison. So I was up front and explaining exactly what I was doing. I didn't want to just create an impression because very often arg arguments are just an impression that you say something to make an impression. I didn't want to do that. Now, regarding the 1 John chapter 5, verse 7, where it talks about uh, the, the Trinity verse, well, first of all, I mean, as Wizam said, none of the early church fathers quote this verse because it only appears in a later translation. And I need to keep coming back to this. It's not included in the Greek text, so it's not amongst those, refer uh, amongst those numbers because it's not in the Greek. So you, you know how there's translations of the Quran and some of them really paraphrase it and make it a lot bigger. Well, that's what you have in that verse. It's, it's where someone has taken the verse and then expanded it in the, their translation. And we, we have that even within the Quran, like people just expand things with their translations. Um, now, I don't accept that translation. I think it's a bad translation. Now, it was in the King James, but that's because they were relying on, the, on, on that translation at that time. And so the King James relied upon the Greek New Testament, but also the Latin, and so that's where it got in. Um, but then as soon as we you know, came into the modern critical period, we just went, no, that it shouldn't be there. And so we go to the original Greek. Thank you for that. Um, we'll move on to Sheikh Hassan. Two minutes. Just a quick note, Bukhari. Do you know how many scholars have utterly lied and attributed things to Bukhari? I just saw one of them on the board. And the thing about it is, I've got, a, I've got a study here. A lot of Orientalists have attributed things in Bukhari, in the Arabic, that are an utter lie, an utter lie, an egregious lie. There's a beautiful book that was written, and it was written by some of the scholars, which I'll bring up, I'll bring up in a moment. But they did a, det a, a detailed by detailed analysis of everything that Bukhari actually said, recounting everything that the Orientalists say. That's number one. The other thing to mention here is, if you look at some hadith, some hadith talks about, like I'll give you an example, there's a, a sahih hadith about Aisha radiallahu anha, so on and so forth, and the Quran that she had. All of a sudden, an Orientalist turns around, he says the goat ate her Quran. Hadith never mentions any such story about a goat eating the Quran. It's outright lie. The, the levels that these people have gone to is, is beyond me. Like you say, why would you do that? You know that's not the case. You haven't attributed it correctly to these authors. That's the other thing. What I would also say is, that's not sufficient to say, oh, it's, it's, it's not in the Greek. If it's not in the Greek. Where are you getting it from? Another translation. Tafsir of Quran is not Quran. Our tafsir of Quran is not Quran. You see what he just said? Like, there's extra meaning. Tafsir is not Qur'an. Qur'an is Qur'an. Every single rasm, every single dot that was placed. And we say dot. Why do we say dot? Because there was a way of reciting it. And I think this is a point that how many times can we say it over and over? Ubay ibn Ka'ab. Ubay ibn Ka'ab and the narrations that he's reading about Ubay ibn Ka'ab are completely and utterly misrepresented. Ubay ibn Ka'ab was reciting Qur'an. This is when it first dawned upon him that the Qur'an was multiformic. That Ubay ibn Ka'ab was reciting, and you know what the Prophet did, Sallallahu He actually told him it was revealed this way. And Ubay ibn Ka'ab had a momentary pause of reality that the multiple recitational divinely revealed. You can't say that about the Bible, but you can about the Qur'an. And is God's speech so limited that he doesn't cater for his creation in terms of... That's enough? Yeah, that's me. All right. 
<laughs> okay, so any more general questions addressed at both speakers? Uh, to the lady at the back. Is this here? Okay. Um, well, my question is mainly um, directed to Samuel, but of course, Sheikh Hussam, I'm going to greatly value his contribution. Um, your argument claims that the preservation of the Qur'an and the Bible um, are both sitting at about 1% variation um, in words, phrases, meanings, etc. Um, and how accurate that statistic is aside, uh, you neglected to touch on the creation of the Trinity at the Council of Nicaea over 300 years after Revelation. So my question is, how can you follow a book and believe in a religion and claim its near perfect preservation when a main tenet of its theology was introduced through a vote three centuries after its revelation? Um, but, but basically what you've just said there is how the conspiracy theories would see it. And it, that's actually not what happened at all at the Council of Nicaea. The Council of Nicaea was a Christological question it didn't actually formulate the Trinity. That comes later. Uh, it touches upon it, but it's, it's not where it's formulated. And the doctrine of the Trinity is absolutely grounded in Scripture. Uh, it, God is a higher order personal being. God is a higher order personal being. And the only problem people had with the Trinity is when they use logic derived from their own experience of being a person to say what is reasonable about God. But we cannot use ourselves to say what God's oneness should look like. We just can't do that. God is a higher order personal being. God is greater than us in power. God is greater than us in knowledge. God is greater than us in person. And the scriptures reveal from beginning to end that the one transcendent God is personally and distinctly present in his word and spirit. And, and so it, 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 it doesn't hang on the Council of Nicaea at all. Thank you for that. So two minutes for Hoshe Hussain. It absolutely does. The Council of Nicaea was where it became orthodox. In fact, there's a good book written, it's called Orthodoxy and Heresy in Earliest Christianity by Walter Buer, 1934. And he said, in fact, that at that time, the orthodox Christianity was, that we have today was regarded, they were regarded as heretics. It wasn't until Eusebius, and he wrote in 324 that the council adopted then in 325. And so it was about who won out. Bart Ehrman says, this and primarily this, I would argue, is why the scribes modified the New Testament in seemingly contradictory ways because they had to defend all these arguments that previously did or did not exist. Also, further, further to that is this. You talk about the Trinity. Jesus, right, he said, someone came to Jesus and says, good master, good master, what good things that I'll do that I have eternal life. Jesus said, why call us thy good? Why call us thy good? You're God. You reject being called good and your God, utter hypocrisy if that's the case. If you're God, you would never reject the attribute of good. He said, why call us thy good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if you would enter into life, then stick to the commandments. What are the commandments? You shall believe your God. Now it goes, one Lord, one Lord, none other than he. This was the belief, this common belief. We accept that, I accept that statement. I accept that statement. I even accept the statement, Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I accept that in his time, true. Muhammad sallam, is the same. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to God except through me. True. Moses, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to God except through me. We would accept that if the prophet said that. No problem. No, I'm not saying the prophet sallam, said it that way or that Musa said it that way. But that is a statement that you would say as a prophet saying that. Of course, you were the guidance and the means of guidance at that time. And so therefore, it holds true that you would say that. So the Trinity, it makes sense that we talk about the Trinity. They threw it out. I didn't throw it out. 30 Christian denominations voted by They said, this is a manual insertion. It was not originally there. He didn't address that. They called it a fabrication, a manual insertion. Thank you for that. Uh -huh. Now, would like to focus our questions on Sheikh Hussam. Um, yeah. So, any question? Any question for Sheikh Hussam? Uh, to the lady uh, with the blonde hair. Hi. 
Um, I just want to say thank you to both Wassam and Sam for how you've prepared and delivered the debate. Um, so I think both Muslims and Christians can, we understand that God revealed the first four books, being the Torah, the Prophets, the Psalms of David, and the Injil. And yeah, we can agree that God is holy and that these, the original copies of these books were sacred. Um, as Christians, we believe that we do have the copies now, but Muslims don't. So my question is, why, if God is all-powerful, why would he let his scriptures be corrupted? Two minutes to respond. If God is all-powerful, why let the scriptures be corrupted? That's a, that's a fantastic point. 124,000 prophets, and they came to their people. How many prophets died? A lot of prophets died. They were killed, weren't they? They were killed by their own people. So they went through a lot of tests and they were subjected to a lot of things. Hence the need for a final, last testament. Now God says in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, illa wusaha. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wa ma hatta rasula. We will not punish a people until we have sent them a messenger. A person will not be punished until they've heard the message in a clear way, in an understandable way. As for the wisdom that you're asking me about in terms of God as to why, I can't answer the wisdom. I can certainly give you answers that would conform to that. And one, th one answer is certainly clear. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon him, who was foretold in the Bible, he was destined to come. And that's part of destiny, right? We don't get involved when it comes to destiny. But if a person doesn't receive the message, this is a counter uh, question. If a person doesn't receive the message, will they go to the hellfire? No. The verse in the Quran says, if a person does not receive the message from a messenger, they will not be punished. Imam Suyuti spoke about this. Imam Suyuti spoke about this in great detail. What happens if there's a period where a prophet did not come to those people? Are they safe? Are they saved? And he said they're saved, right? Irrespective of what they believed. And this is a, this is a very important theological thing to understand. Going back just a step before that, human beings have a natural inclination to believe in a divine, all-powerful being. And I like the way you first asked that question, an all-powerful divine being. It's a natural inclination. If God doesn't send the prophet, there's no punishment in accordance with what? That Quranic script, five seconds, 10 seconds, one second. <laughs> well, it's, thank you for that. Um, we have time for just one more question for Samuel Green. Um, Uh, to the boy all the way at the back, all the way at the back. Oh, yep, thank you for your time, Samuel. So I'm a bit confused about your argument about the 10 qira'a. Uh, so you're saying, I think, different Sahaba had different recitations leading to different Qira, something like this. But the uh, Qur'an Sanad in Hafs, he learned from Asim, from As-Sulami, from five Sahaba, Uthman, Ali, Zaid ibn Thabit, Ubay ibn Ka'b, and um, ibn Mas'ud. So my question is, um, your, what exactly is your argument? Which Sahaba led to which Qira? How did the ten come to existence? Okay. Um, so when you read the Quran, it never talks about the ten aharuf, it never talks about the ten qira'at. So the Quran just speaks of itself as one. You only read about the aharuf, the seven aharuf, which we Sam spoke about before amongst the companions. You, you read about this in the hadith. And, and so what you find is that the, the, there's this discussion in the hadith about how do you recite the Quran? And as I gave for that hadith on Bukhari, where it talks about uh, the, 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 the Islamic soldiers going to fight in Azerbaijan and Armenia, and they've got differences in the Quran. So we have these differences evolving, and then the, uh, you know, the claim is, which you were just pointing out when you were reading the Isnad, the claim was that they all go back to a... A, um, to, to a Sahaba, to one of the companions. Um, 
Now, you'll notice that there's 10 authorised kira'at and there's seven um, aharuf. So that there's not 10 aharuf. So we've got to go from the seven aharuf. This is getting very technical for many people now, but we've got to go from the seven aharuf, which are, are these, parent, you know, the, the, these different ways of reciting the Quran, to the 10. Now, what happens with the seven, and what happens with the seven is that because the Uthmatic script is ambiguous and you can put the dots and dashes in different places, across the Islamic empire, people put the dots and dashes in different places. This is why they start to learn Arabic grammar, so they can know what's the correct way of doing it. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you read the Islamic scholars, they'll talk about how there were many different kira'ats. There wasn't just 10, there was dozens and dozens. And Ibn Mujahid had to make a decision in the fourth Islamic century to choose seven, and then he added more in time, and I, you know, I believe it's up to 14 or something now. So, yep, yeah, so uh, that's a big topic. I've written about it online. I have an article called The Different Arabic Versions of the Quran, which takes you through all of that stuff. All right. Thank you to our audience and thank you to our speakers. That will be it for our audience Q&A, but we have one final section for a four-minute closing statement from each of our speakers. So we'll start with just some rules. So I'll, you'll hear a, a bing at one minute left, and then once those four minutes are over, um, I'll just hit it a lot of times. I'll be annoying. Um, so we'll start with Samuel Green. Uh, do you want a presentation? I'll, I'll just, just do it here. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. We've spoken very frankly with each other, and that's not always easy. But I think that the fact that we've been able to do this peacefully, uh, enthusiastically, but still peacefully and respectfully is really good. And uh, I love with Sam, we've had him in Tasmania, and it's always great to, to come and um, talk with him. Just to give a summary of where I went in my presentation today, my first point was that the common claim in leaflets like these that the Quran's been perfectly memorised has no evidence in the Quran or in the Hadith. And I showed two verses from the Quran where it says it's been forgotten, and I showed the Hadith where it says entire surahs have been forgotten, and that um, uh, Abdullah, I think it's Abdullah ibn Umar, said no one should say he's got all the Quran, but only just what remains. Now, I don't think that that's really been answered. Those verses and those claims from the Hadith, I think, stand. That you may want to say that people are memorising the Quran now since Uthman, but there's plenty of evidence that I gave that before that time, things had been forgotten, things had been lost, and that's just what it says. And I encourage you to go and look at those references. It was good to see progress being made. As I said, in the past when we've had these discussions, Muslims would just say, there's one Quran, no variation, one Quran. And now we've actually made progress so that we know about the different Qur'ats and the types of differences between them. And, and we're being told that it's multi-formed. It's multi-formed. Okay, that's, well, please talk about it as multi-formed when you talk about it. Don't talk about it as one, talk about it as multi-formed. When it came to the the Bible, I showed that we have ancient manuscripts, ancient translations, ancient quotes, and that scholars, and I showed you the, the, the critical editions of the Greek New Testaments where they've done a lot of hard work in going through these and proving that the manuscripts that we have, that the Bible we have, is well preserved. We can go back to all the ancient copies from different regions and we can look at them and there is no other New Testament apart from what we've got. There is no other New Testament. Um, my final point was that the Quran says that the Bible is well preserved. That, sorry, that the Bible is to be treated alongside of the Quran. And I gave the verse where it says, make no distinction between any of the holy books. Now, I also gave that reference from chapter 5, where it says that the gospel given to Jesus is what Christians have. The Quran says in Surah uh, 7157, and I've forgotten the other one now, it says that it's the scripture that is with them. It says that Muhammad's foretold in the scripture that is with them, and it uses this phrase of with them. It's not talking about books getting lost. It never says the Bible's been lost. 
That, that, that's just a later idea. It says the scripture that is with them is what the Christians are to follow. And so that's what Muslims are meant to make no distinction between those books. This idea of the Bible being lost has no basis in the Quran. And then my final point was simply this, that the Bible is not one book. It's a collection of many books from many prophets. It has the law of Moses, the books of uh, the, the Psalms, the books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, the gospel, a whole range of different books. And for Muslim leaders to be saying to you, do not read the prophets, just listen to what Muhammad says about the prophets, I want to say that's dangerous. If someone said to you, don't read the Quran, I'll just tell you what it's about. You'd say, no, 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 d don't do that. But that's what Muslims are saying to us. You're saying, stop reading the prophets and just listen to one man. And I'm saying, no, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Samuel Green, for your closing statement. Now we'll conclude with the closing statement from Sheikh Hussain. Just some very quick points. First and foremost, the word that he said what Quran means, he's got the wrong understanding of what the word Quran means. The word Quran is derived from Qara'a Yakru'u, which means to collect, to recite. Get the facts straight. Number two, the dots and dashes have nothing to do with grammar. Nothing to do with grammar. Yasin was always yed, read Yasin. Pick up any one of these copies. No one ever read Yasin. No one ever read Noonsin or Noonshin. It was always read Yasin. Why? Verbal, uninterrupted transmission. He's forgetting that and he's, I think why he's casting that aside is beyond me uninterrupted transmission, never ever subject to grammar. This is just a complete falsity, mutawatir. And he talks about other, other recitations. The other recitations that he's talking about, we're not talking, classifying them in the uninterrupted category, mutawatir. You've put them in a different category and we just simply, we don't accept it. And I don't accept how before, you know, there was a slide that you put up and it wasn't really analyzed properly. There's a great, fantastic book. It was, it's called, the insignificance of corrections in early, in early Quran manuscripts written by great, great scholars, Mansur Ahmad Farid al-Bahrani, very, very good to look at for everybody here. Also in said, whoever said the Quran was uniformic? Which scholar? Give me his name. I would actually be quite surprised if you can name me one Islamic scholar in the entire of our literature who ever said that the Quran is read in one mode. Or uniformic? Who? Who said that? One. Give me one. Just one scholar who said it's uniformic. The other one that we say, for example, we cause the Quran to be forgotten. He talks about the Quran being forgotten. We, Allah says, Nahnu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Himself, attributed to Himself His words. Are we holding God to account for what He says? His words. God can cause and do what he likes, as the sister said before, the all-powerful. Also, God says, he's quoting the Quran, God also says, don't say three. Don't say three. Stop. It's better for you. Don't say three. He, it, uh, critically addressing, specifically addressing the Trinity. I'm running short of time. The conclusion, the Quran has a connected chain. Physical evidence, which he never talked about. The phylogenetic analysis, which he never discussed at all. Scientifically, 100% of the Quran in manuscripts, uh, manuscripts that are extant, in, actually physically present, available. It's multiformic nature, not uniformic. No scholar ever said it was uniformic. The Codex Committee, nothing could bypass the Codex Committee in any way, shape or form, right? Ubay ibn Ka'b, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, they all conform. At-talaqi al-mutawatir, the scholars, you know, from the scholars of the scholars, all of it conforms exactly. He didn't talk about Van Puden's, Van Puden's diagram, he talks about directly Ibn Mas'ud, how that direct, directly links to the prototype of the Prophet. If we have a look then, and we see the Bible has a disconnected chain, 0% of all manuscripts date back to the first century. The scribes, altered texts, unknown authors. The philosophy of history means you can make any claim about people in the past and give some type of evidence to say whether or not it happened. But if we look at the Roman sources, Jesus is not even mentioned in any of their sources. Does that mean he doesn't exist? The debate ought to be about the pursuit of truth. 
This is what this should be about, the pursuit of truth, theological implications, beliefs before 325, all of these things that we're saying, discovered books even today. If this is about truth and you are a juror, and you are doing a side-by-side -side analysis, he has not adequately or satisfactorily, has not made the case of preservation in any way, shape or form. The Quran stands apart as the final testament of God. There is no question, there is no doubt, there is no ambu ambiguity. It is absolutely and utterly clear that it is a talakil mutawatir oral, unbroken, uninterrupted transmission, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Ubay ibn Ka'ab, you name it. They all feature in the 10 confirmed recitals dating directly back to the Prophet. I just wanna say before I finish, I'm not gonna say any more on that, that I actually am good mates with Samuel. Um, we are, we are actually good mates. We are actually good friends. And so this has got nothing to do with the debate anymore. I'm not gonna speak about that, I wanna be fair. But we are good friends and he calls me sometimes to come down to Tasmania and he told me to come up whenever we have a debate here, he wants, he wants to come up. So I appreciate Samuel coming down. He is a good man. He went to take me last time to Tasmania, but it was too cloudy to go up into the mountains. But, you know, I might take you up on the offer sometime. I do thank you for being here. I thank our Muslim brothers and sisters and also Christians and people of other faiths. And, and if you don't have a faith, for being here to partake in that. I'll give Samuel the opportunity to also say something as a closing if he likes. But thank you very much for coming here tonight. It is robust discussion. It is good discussion. Please don't assume anything but respect that I have for this man. When it comes to this dialogue, it is serious talk. And so that, I thank you again. And if Samuel wants to say something, of course, absolutely. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So I feel like there's a lot of excitement here today. Everyone's pretty hyped. Good stuff. I look forward to the dialogue conversations at EU. I'm looking at you. Have a good one. All right. So a big thank you to both of our speakers tonight. Ahmed, thank you for being the moderator. And that was the hot seat. You might get called uh, sexist and all this other stuff for always picking the woman, but it's a different story. Um, thank you for everyone for attending. All right. No running a mark. Thank you everyone for attending. And a reminder that our IW is still underway for 2023. A schedule of the flight is available, we're just going to pull it up right now. We have another debate, this time atheism, we can unite for once. EU Muslims, come, please. Um, yeah, we have stores running daily. Tomorrow the stores will be on Calico Green, but on Thursday and Friday it will be um, on Eastern Avenue as it has, oh no, sorry, I messed up. <laughs> Wednesdays on Eastern Avenue, Thursday and Fridays on Calico Green, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Do come down for a conversation and a chat. And I do want to give gifts to Sheikh Wissam, Samuel Green, and Amir, you as well. Thank you.